I hope everybody has coffee and is prepared for Arthur's talk. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce Arthur Gideva, uh, who is a professor at Kaiserslautern University, maybe with the new name of the university right now. Rheinland-Pfälzische Technische Universität Kaiserslautern Landau. Okay, so it's become a little bit longer. Choose simple names. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, Arthur did his, uh, his undergraduate work at the Würzburg University, then did his master's already traveling abroad uh, with uh, Mark Raisin in, in Texas, and later on did his diploma work with uh, Ted Hensch, and, uh, and then continued from there, maybe following Immanuel Bloch, I guess, mm -hmm. to Mainz, uh, where he worked with uh, Immanuel, and, uh, and then uh, went from, I guess, many atoms to few atoms when he switched to Bonn, where he worked with Dieter Meschedev, and then since 2010, he has his own group at uh, the University of Kaiserslautern, and has really done some work there, which is interesting for us in various different ways. First of all, with respect to the impurity work that we are very interested in, but also with respect to um, uh, sort of quantum machines um, that, that there is a joint interest in, which we haven't really uh, been able to exploit so far, but maybe we find an occasion for that. Moreover, I just found out when you last visited, uh, because we were curious why we couldn't find out when Arthur had last visited. And it turns out I was talking to Paul Pearson, Ah. The first PhD student here, the first one in the lattice lab, um, who is holding a talk uh, at the alumni fair downstairs as an employee of Vestas. And he said, Ah, Arthur, yes, sure, he was yeah, yeah. Alexander. So, exactly, so I remember. The last time you were here was in 2014 for the PhD defense of Paul Thurston. Nine years, wow. So, it's glad to, we're very glad to have you here. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for the invitation. It has been already an extremely exciting day, very interesting talks, discussions, and uh, I expect more to come. Um, <clears throat> I want to tell you today a little bit about a work that we've done on one experiment where we couple, as I wrote, single atomic impurities to an ultra-cold gas. Before doing so, let me say two sentences about Kaiserslautern. For those of you who have no idea where it is, if you go down the Rhine River, so north to south, you come to Mannheim, Heidelberg, this area, and then you go west. Then before you hit Belgium or, or the, the French border, halfway there is Kaiserslautern. It's a city, 100,000 inhabitants. To the Germans, I have to say it's not Karlsruhe. It's, I don't know why, it's, it's just often mixed up and uh, we had renowned speakers ending up in the wrong city. <laughs> so Kaiserslautern. All right. <clears throat> What I would like to tell you today is um, a little bit about, yeah, generally why ultra cold. Most of you might know this, but I figured since the work I present today is not in a um, bose einstein condensate, still why do we want to become ultra cold? What is the benefit of doing so? I'll tell you a little bit about the experimental tools. And then I have three topics I would like to discuss. The first is how can we use single atoms as quantum probes to probe properties of the gas? The second is how can we maybe, if we think about miniaturization, use a single atom as a quantum engine and, and really, well, do work with this? How can this be understood at all? And then in both cases, you will find one peculiar observation, that is, if we look at the spin distribution in the non-equilibrium uh, dynamics, that we reach a point of entropy in the system that is maximal. And that was striking until I met a colleague, and uh, with him we now do a project, or we did a project, on a phase transition in time in an open system. And I'll explain you, if time permits, um, I'll explain you what this is. And if there are any questions, please feel free, interrupt me, ask. I I'm happy about this. So this is the team, and let me first point out um, the PhD student. So that is Jens. Uh, he is for the machine and the, the probes, the one. Um, there is Sabrina and Silvia, the next generation students, and uh, Julian, um, he started a year later. Uh, the others are master students, and let me point out um, collaborations with Erik Lutz in Stuttgart, and André Eckertling Navu and uh, um, uh, Alexander Schnell in Berlin now. 
And we get funding from German Science Foundation and State Research Center Optimus. All right. So why ultra cold atoms? So you all know because it's cool, it's ultra cool, but uh, you can do a Bose-Einstein cell condensate, but as I said, that's not what we want to do. We want to go to ranges where the de Broglie wave, so here is a, a temperature scale, and you see we want to go to a temperature region here around nano Kelvin where the de Broglie wavelength becomes large, that we see it easily. We use laser cooling for this, and actually this I skip how laser cooling is done, you know. The dream I started with, like uh, it's now uh, 15 years ago, is the following. Uh, why don't we take a Bose-Einstein condensate or an ultra-cold rubidium gas and put in a well-controlled number of impurities, in this case cesium atoms? And the way I envision to do is to just shuttle them in using some kind of conveyor belt. And I'll tell you later that that is exactly what we have realized. And the question is now, what can we expect? What is the, what is the picture you should have in mind? What are the relevant energy or, or scales that we have? And let me contrast this a little bit against our everyday experience in, in air. So if you look at the temperature in our ambient air, it's of course room temperature, 300 Kelvin, whereas in the ultra-cold gas, as I said here, far below micro Kelvin, maybe 100 nano Kelvin. The direct consequence is that the particle velocity drops from hundreds of meters per second. If we could pick out a molecule here, we would have a few hundred meters per second, down to centimeter or even millimeter per second. And that means that technologically, it is absolutely possible to track the motion of single particles in the trap. So in principle, that is possible. At these low temperatures, of course, you would expect that the ground state of any system is a crystal. And the same happens for us. And in order to prevent working with a chunk of rubidium or, or whatever, we need to dilute the system uh, and go from particle densities in air of 10 to the 19 to maybe 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 per cubic centimeter. And, um, and that makes the collisions that form a crystal extremely rare, and thereby we can work with a gas on a relevant time scale. If you look at phase-based density, that means uh, the product of uh, density and the Broglie wavelength cubed, then in air we have a very small number, but most of, uh, most of you will know that in cold gases, this can become significantly larger than one, then you form a Bose-Einstein condensate, not so relevant here. But what is relevant is the collision rate that you have in these gases. So how many collisions do particles do per second? And in air, we have a mind-blowing number of 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10 per second, whereas in our experiment, we are on the order of one collision per second, maybe one collision per millisecond. And again, that is a time scale or a rate that is experimentally absolutely easy to follow. We can see, in principle, the consequence of each individual collision in the gas. And what we can do with this? Well, lots of things. Classically, the, it can be a model system for friction or diffusion, but especially for quantum systems, like a study of open quantum systems, study of decoherence, and the dream is that we do condo physics and really simulate C, effects that have been predicted for solid state physics. Good. How do we do this? And the sketch, again, that you should have in your mind, cloud, atom, we shuttle it in. How do we do it? The heart of all this is a vacuum system that is shown here. Um, these, these blocks are, are uh, ion pumps. Uh, everything takes place in this glass cell here. And I usually say the whole lab that you'll see on the next slides is there to look and to shine lasers. Um, from all directions into a volume of 100 by 100 by 100 micrometers. So that's where it all takes place, and the whole lab is just there to serve this purpose. Um, if you work with single atoms and gases, um, it is clever to find a way to produce the gas, the cold gas or the Bose-Einstein condensate, very rapidly, because the statistics is limited by the single atom. If you have one result, the Bose-Einstein condensate is gone, and then you have to redo it again. And if you work with single results from an experiment, then you have to accumulate statistics. And doing here an experiment, a Bose-Einstein condensate in 40 seconds or four seconds is the difference between four-year PhD or 10-year PhD. So it's a real significant change. And uh, therefore, we took great care to optimize this. So we have a, a laser cooling in two dimensions here, forming a brilliant beam of rubidium into this glass cell. Here, we trap it all in an all optical trap. We evaporate and can produce a Bose-Einstein condensate in a few seconds. 
And uh, this was optimized, among others, by, for example, a genetic algorithms, algorithm keeping track of, it crashed, oh no, keeping track of um, all the well, subtle correlations. That is my pointer. Okay. So it's a cool thing because people can see it also on Zoom, but sometimes it crashes. Good. So this uh, genetic algorithm or evolutionary algorithm keeps track of all these, well, technical correlations that you don't know and you don't want to know. It just optimizes it. And, my, and the PhD students don't like to hear it. But whenever they optimized it, the algorithm could get a factor of two or something. So it really pays off. In the lab, it looks like a standard quantum gas lab. There is one table here for all the um, lasers. Um, we, well, prepare all the properties like frequency, intensity, polarization, whatever you like, then couple it into glass fibers, feed it over the ceiling, and the vacuum system is here buried in three layers of optics, like probably what you also see here in quantum optics labs. Good. Now, you are familiar with uh, quantum gases. Let's turn to the single atoms. What we do to get single or a few atoms is we take a laser cooling region, a magneto-optical trap, but we reduce the loading rate a lot that we do by cranking up the gradient of the magnetic field. And this is the very, very first picture of our single atom mod. Uh, so here you see the aperture of the objective and something fluoresces. And if you now look at this over time, then and plot, for example, here the fluorescence rate as a function of time, then you see individual steps and uh, you see dynamics going on. If you do statistics on this, then you can assign these levels to the background light and the presence of one atom, two atoms, three atoms, and so forth in the trap. So we know exactly from the fluorescence how many atoms we have, and that's fine. The problem is we don't want to have our atoms fluorescing all the time. We want to trap them also in a, in a trap that is where they are dark, where we can do quantum physics with them. That we, uh, means we need a dipole trap that is ideally seen only by the cesium atoms. And what I plot here is the dipole potential that is exerted on a, uh, by a laser beam of a wavelength that is shown here onto the two atomic species, rubidium in blue and cesium in red. What you see is for any of these alkali, you have two resonance lines. And these resonance lines are the positions where the dipole force or the dipole potential diverges. You see that um, on the left and to the right of this resonance, the dipole potential has a sign change. And that is what you know from Physics 101, a driven harmonic oscillator, if you drive it above or below the frequency, if you go across the resonance frequency, you get a um, sign change. And that is exactly the sign change we see here, or the phase jump of pi. And you see, because of that, directly between the two resonance lines, there is a zero crossing of this dipole potential. That means there is one wavelength where one species does not see any dipole potential of the laser. For rubidium, it is here at 790 nanometers. And at this wavelength, cesium is far detuned. And you see a potential for cesium, or cesium sees a potential. Rubidium does not. We tune our laser to this wavelength. And we shine two counterpropagating lasers to form a standing wave and trap the single atoms, as shown here in the minima of the potential. And now we can detune the laser beams a little bit uh, by using uh, acoustic-optical modulators, and that sets it in motion, and we can shuttle the cesium atoms in our trap as we wish. And here is a picture. What you see here are three atoms. We can shuttle them to the left, to the right. So we have these marble properties completely under control. And now to show you how we take our data and what's behind then later on all these data points that we have, let's imagine uh, if we could see the traps in our uh, glass cell. There is a cross dipole trap shown, indicated here in red. And just 180 micrometers away from the crossing region is the laser cooling region for the single cesium mod. And now we can do a very simple experiment. We can release the cesium atom into this dipole trap. It will do some motion. And after a certain time, we want to know where it is. We flash on our lattice. We freeze its position. Then we take a fluorescence image. And that is what we get. So in every single run, we get one of these images. Here in the first one, you have five atoms. In order to get statistics, we have to repeat this over and over again. Then we get the 
well, classical probability distribution. And if we're interested only on the axial position, we bin this um, vertically and get the axial probability distribution as shown here. And then we can do this, of course, time resolved and see, for example, here in a very simple way, one quarter of an oscillation period of the atom in the trap. You see the center of mass does just simple oscillation. The shape changes due to residual temperature and because there is anharmonicity due to the crossing region. So this shaded area indicates where the crossing region is. Nothing special. But now we can put the rubidium cloud in the crossing region. And what we we'll observe then is that the cesium atoms get stuck. And that is also not so surprising. It's diffusion. Just by elastic collisions, the cesium atom lose energy. They become diffusive, but now fun starts. And now we can do physics looking at the interaction between single cesium atoms and the rubidium gas. And now we have to talk for a few minutes about interaction processes um, and atomic physics. So the picture you should have in mind for the rest of, or for the next 20 minutes maybe, <clears throat> is this one. It's really the gas is a classical gas, point-like particles. There is one impurity and you interact, you collide with the atoms from the gas. And of course now you all know there is one interaction process that is usually there and that is elastic interactions. What does elastic mean? Elastic means that the kinetic energy is redistributed among the colliding partners but the internal states are preserved. And with internal states, I mean here the hyperfine states of the atoms. Rubidium is, has a ground state, hyperfine ground state, F equal one, with three Siemens substates that are indicated here as these little rings. And this is preserved. And cesium has an F equal three hyperfine ground state and seven Siemens substates. And again, these are also preserved in the collision. So these elastic collision, they lead to thermalization, they lead to, later on we will talk about coherence properties and decoherence, dephasing. So that's all that is associated with some kind of uh, scattering length A that is uh, associated here with this elastic collisions. For a large part of the talk, uh, we'll be interested in a second process and that is spin exchange. And as the name says, the two colliding partners exchange one quantum of angular momentum. So rubidium, in this case, re, um, enhances its angular momentum and cesium gives away one quantum of angular momentum. Uh, and, and this is, as, as you can imagine, it's just a, a flip of the spin. Here a little more complicated because the spin state is larger, but that's in principle not a big deal. Now we have to talk a little bit about the details of these spin exchange processes because that will be important. So these processes have a certain scattering rate or a scattering cross-section and that can be calculated by coupling channel calculations. I do not talk about this uh, much more. Uh, we don't do them, I mean in the meantime we do it ourselves, but in the beginning we took them from Eva Thiemann. He is an um, uh, atomic physicist uh, from uh, Hannover and did for decades calculations of molecular potentials where all these numbers came out with extremely high precision. And here is an example of what he can calculate for us. So what is shown here is the scattering cross section for the spin exchange collisions that depend now on the internal state of the rubidium atom. And for this graph, it is fixed to one Siemens substate. And all the different lines correspond to different Siemens substates of cesium. I didn't even bother to write it on there because it doesn't matter for you. It's just important. It's all different. And there are very different regions where, where the scattering can have different character. There are regions where all the scattering cross sections are essentially the same. There are resonances, and these are low-lying Feschbach resonances that occur also in the spin exchange. And you see there is a region where a new process comes into play, and I'll talk about this in a minute. First, let's focus on this case, and I want to show you that also experimentally we see all this. So let's go to one of these magnetic fields here and let's see what happens. We, we prepare the cesium atom in a spin state, we let it evolve and what we expect is that bop, 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 by individual spin exchange processes the spin changes and goes to the other extreme value. And what is shown here are the seven Siemens substates with the initial population prepared here in the uppermost. And as a function of time you see color coded that the population indeed is brought to the other to the, to the other extreme. So it just goes completely down. And here, of course, 
We do it with full counting statistics. We see for every single atom how many collisions it has made, but we need to take the statistics to make a statement in a quantum mechanical sense. Now let's go to one of the zeros here of the Feschbach resonance. And what you find there is indeed that we can block one of these channels essentially. And if we compare this with a model with a scattering cross section by Eva Thiemann, it fits here to a percent level. So we know very, very well what the spin dynamics of our atoms are. Okay, now we have to talk about this region where this additional process comes into play. And for this, we need to go one step further into detail of the rubidium cesium system. What I've shown here is the Zeeman splitting in a given magnetic field of rubidium and of cesium. And you see that the values of the, cesium, of the Zeeman splitting changes or is different by a factor of two. And this factor of two comes because the Landé factor, this GF factor, differs by a factor of two. If you remember your atomic physics lectures, this Landé factor summarizes just all this complicated angular momentum coupling of the nucleus with the electronic shell. So this is all hidden in this G factor. And it just turns out that there is a factor of two difference. Now, this has a consequence. Let's imagine rubidium goes down from this m equals zero state to an energetically lower lying state, uh, and cesium takes this up. Well, that works. Angular momentum conservation is fulfilled, and energy conservation says cesium has half of the energy left that is kinetic energy, and it's dissipated by elastic collisions in the gas. And in our case, we have 10 elastic collisions on average between two spin exchange collisions. So it re-thermalizes. No problem. We call this collision an exothermal collision. It can always occur. Now, let's imagine rubidium is down here and wants to go up. Then cesium, if it goes down, can provide half of the energy, but the rest is missing. Where is it coming from? And the only way it can come from is from the kinetic energy of the collision. And these endoergic processes, therefore, cannot occur every time for every collision, but it depends on how much energy comes from the thermal distribution. That means, here I plot it again, if rubidium wants to go up, half of the energy comes from the energy of the cesium spin change, and the rest must come from the thermal energy distribution. And if you plot here the, um, where the distribution of collision energies, you see this gray shaded area, all the collisions here, all the energies here cannot contribute to an endothermal collision. Only the purple shaded area here have, has enough energy to really promote the endothermal collision. So that will be the most important tool that we use because what it does is it couples the thermal distribution of the gas to the internal quantum states. And this will use from now on in every possible way. This fraction can be calculated. It's not a big deal. There is a formula, uh, you can integrate it, and then you find here the probability for these endothermal collisions is just a function of the temperature or the thermal energy and the magnetic field or the Zeeman energy. And it just compares the Zeeman splitting with the width of the thermal energy distribution. That's all. All right. And with this, we can now make the first experiment. And what we'll do now in the following is, we'll, what you see here is a typical result. Here are the seven Zeeman substates of the cesium impurity. That is the population of the individual impurity. And this is the time evolution that we have. And we start, for example, here in, one, in a polarized state. Then something happens. You have dynamics going on. And then eventually it will come to some steady state. And in the following, I will first explain how from this we can make a probe, like a thermometer for the gas, in several ways. And in the next, I will explain you how we can engineer to use this as a little machine to really, well, in our case, we don't extract work, but a machine in a sense of an auto cycle that we do in the system. All right. Thomas. Just a quick question back to this. These energy constraints that you just described, like also a two season, like a three body two season going down and one. <clears throat> okay. So in our case, first, um, the gas is so dilute that three body uh, collisions are, I mean, they will limit us, but they are very rare. And the cesium cesium, uh, we have like five, maybe 10 cesium atoms. They are during this experiment usually 
uh, separated from each other by the optical ladder, so they cannot, there is one in each, exactly. And even it, if it was not, then the probability would be a factor of 100 larger than a three-body recombination. So we exclude this. Good. So let's talk about thermometers. And this brings us to the question, what is a thermometer? And the, the paradigm of thermometry is you take a system, a sensing system, you stick it into your target system, you let it equilibrate, and then you measure some measure of mean kinetic energy, right? That's what every usually most thermometers do. And this you can transfer to the cold gases, and many people have done it. So you can just take impurities and measure the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the kinetic energy distribution, and di assign a temperature to this. And that has been done many, many times before. So for example, people have done this and looked at different Siemens states in a rubidium cloud, that's then stamper currents group. There are groups that stick a little uh, Bose-Einstein condensate in large Fermi clouds in uh, Rudi Grimm's group. And we also measured the kinetic energy distribution of our impurity and by this looked at a thermometer. That's all possible. But that's all a classical thermometer, right? You look at the kinetic energy distribution. We want now to map thermal information onto the quantum states to really make this a quantum information. And the difference is that the equilibration to the thermal energy distribution is done by the elastic collisions. And the key to map this onto the quantum states is the spin exchange collisions. And as I said, it is exactly this comparison of Zeeman splitting by um, the thermal energy distribution. So what we do is exactly now this sketch. Uh, we, we shuttle the cesium atoms into the gas, let it evolve, and then measure the spin population distribution as a function of time. And let's see what we learn from this. That's exactly the same data you just saw. Now let me give you one, one intuitive explanation of what happens. You start here with a polarized or with one uh, spin polarization. You let it run, you see there is a lot of dynamics going on, but the dynamics goes on because the endoergic processes tries to push the population to the right. The exoergic tried to push the population to the left until you reach in the end the steady state. Now let's go to the extreme limit. If we had hypothetically t equals zero, there were no endoergic collisions. And that means the steady state would be just a all population in the extreme uh, state down here. Now, every little bit of temperature gives you a little bit of endoergic collisions, and that means the temperature information must be in these small fluctuations here that bring you away from the smallest energy state. So we just looked now at the energy fluctuations of this steady state distribution. Uh, that is just the variance of this. And here I plot this energy variance in uh, you, uh, divided by Kb <coughs> as a function of the gas temperature. And what you see, it's really a very nice line. So that's what you hope for a thermometer, that the quantity you measure, these fluctuations, are somehow proportional to the real temperature. The only problem could be, and now you can imagine what could change this. Because it's the steady state, it cannot be the initial state. It cannot be the atom number or density in the gas. It cannot be the number of spin exchange collisions because in the steady state, you don't care about all this, right? The steady state is just a question in the end of the rates of, uh, that you have. The only thing that could now modify the slope of this is the magnetic field you're at. And this is shown here that the slope is essentially in the range we look at independent of the magnetic field. If you change this by a larger amount then the first resonances come, then resonances are not covered by this. So in principle, that works. And, um, and we thought we are happy until we noticed, if we look here at the time, 400 milliseconds, and uh, Thomas' question. Uh, yes, you have another one? Uh, why do you do the fluctuations, not just the average spin? That should also reflect the measurement. Yes, I mean, we, we thought for, I mean, there are several ideas you could have. One would be to fit a Boltzmann mm -hmm. distribution, right? But then you could argue that a Boltzmann distribution already sticks in some knowledge that it should be a temperature or something. And to just look at the fluctuations was the most model independent quantity we could think about. And you say, um, you, say you want to look at the spin distributions directly. Mm -hmm. We'll do this in a, in a second. 
you get more information out of that than, than this. <coughs> Expecting this linearity between the fluctuation and the temperature doesn't contain also an assumption on, on a macroscopic model. No? I mean, this is not an expectation. This is, this is really now here inferred. Right? This was not clear from the beginning. It could be, it could be different, and I, and I agree, if you calibrate it once, then it's also fine. But yes, in, in the end, maybe it's, it, yes, you can expect it if you see what I said. It's just a comparison of thermal energy with Zeeman splitting, right? There is not more to this. Okay? How do you measure the final state? Um, I mean, here, the, the final state, you just, you just wait long enough and you, and you measure the population. Uh, no, uh, no, no, we, um, okay, so the question is, you saw the pictures of the individual atoms. So what we do is we selectively um, de um, decide one MF state that we want to probe. We remove all others from the trap and see if the atom remains. So we do it in a very inefficient way because at that time we had no other means. Now there are some other, like camera technology is much better that we can do this much faster in a different way. At that time we had to do it very inefficiently. What I wanted to say is that if you look at the times here um, and, and what uh, Thomas asked before about three-body recombination, this is a time scale indeed where the cesium atom can get lost. And we were aware that this is not the best way to do. On the other hand, you can ask, there is a lot of information going on here in this non-equilibrium distribution and the question is, can you learn something from this? Um, and in particular, one question was, what's the entropy of the system doing? And uh, so we, just for fun, or, or we, we checked what is the uh, Shannon entropy of this distribution as a function of time. And what you see is that um, it peaks extremely fast after just three spin exchange collisions. That is the case when you have here the most extended uh, spin distribution before it relaxes to the steady state. And the question was, this point in principle tells you that there should be a lot of information that you can gain from the system. How, do we can, how can we extract it? And clearly, if we are in the non-equilibrium, not in the steady state, then we cannot expect that the information here is independent of everything, but we have to put knowledge in to get the information out. So we had to make a model of the spin dynamics. It's a very simple rate model where we have here all the different Siemens spin uh, states. Between the states, there is a certain rate that promotes uh, population between them for the exo or the endoergic. And each rate is a product here of the mean gas density, the colliding velocity, and that's where the, um, uh, the thermal distribution comes into play, and the scattering cross-section, and this value we get from Eva Thiemann. <coughs> it's in general magnetic field and temperature dependent. So with this, we model the dynamics and then we just model it for several temperatures and make a least squares fit and see at which temperature we get the best agreement for the given interaction time. That is an example here. The histogram is the, um, the model and the data points is our data. So there we get also after much earlier, after just three ex uh, spin exchange collisions, temperature information of the system. And now the question is how good is it? And what I show here is a graph that is showing on the vertical axis the temperature we get from our cesium spin, that means the cesium atom, and we measure the spin population. And on the horizontal axis, we take the temperature of the rubidium gas by time of flight velocimetry. So different method, different system, just in thermal contact. And this is not a fit, but that's just the, the equality line, right? So same, same temperature everywhere. And what do you see? There are deviations where we have to admit we don't understand where they come from. What we find, however, is that indeed the error that we have here in the spin population measurement is significantly smaller than for the time of flight velocimetry. And the reason is that at these low densities where we are, uh, density measurements are difficult and therefore the systematic errors increase. So in principle that works. And now the question that you could have if you talk about a sensor is how sensitive is it? What's the sensitivity that you get? And the sensitivity can be um, defined, derived as follows. So our spin population uh, can be written as a density matrix that is diagonal, 
Right? You have here the population for a certain spin state, and the n's are the spin state that you have. And then you have to ask the question, if you have a different uh, or a population at a slightly different temperature, what is the difference between the two states? And mathematically, you can cast the difference between the two populations into a length, kind of length that is called, called the Buer's distance. And uh, depending on where you look, there is also something called the Helling length that is a classical measure. And in our case, because we don't have any off-diagonal elements, it is purely classical diagonal system. Then you can ask the question, if we now take this, this Buer's distance for very small changes of the temperature, you, we can make a Taylor expansion. And the proportionality constant in front of this Taylor expansion is something like the square root of the Fisher information that we take as the sensitivity. So how strongly are, is the change if you make a little deviation from your original temperature? And this can be calculated now for all the, um, for all the data points we have. And what you see here is for the same data points as we had before, as a, uh, well, here's the sensitivity as a function of time. The dashed line is the ideal steady state sensitivity where it decays to. And you see that in non-equilibrium, you beat the steady state sensitivity by an order of magnitude. That means in this non-equilibrium dynamics, you can measure temperature much more sensitively than in the steady state. And the intuitive reason is, I told you, it's the endoergic collisions that, make the that give you the information. So what, what the system has to do is to distinguish how many endoergic do you have compared to the exoergic. In the steady state, it's a difference of the rates that you have that make these little fluctuations. In the non-equilibrium, with the state we start with, um, it is all the population that is to the right, to the higher MF states compared to the others that give you this own information. And that is indeed um, a better signal, a more sensitive signal than the mixed rate ratio of the two rates that you have in the end. All right. Now, you cannot only do this, you can turn this around and do a magnetic field sensor because in the end, it's just a comparison again of the thermal distribution with the Zeeman splitting. That means for a fixed temperature, you can also infer the magnetic field that you have. And here is the magnetic field of this, that the cesium impurity sees and inferred by the spin population measurement as a function of or, or versus the rubidium gas magnetic field that we infer by uh, the standard radio frequency spectroscopy. And here the same works also nice and also the sensitivity peaks here after a couple of spin exchange collisions. Yes, please. Swapped, right? the swap, the, the, the I think the two graphs are swapped. Ah, ah, I'm sorry, exactly. Uh, <coughs> that is, exactly, it is, um, maybe we go to this graph. Um, the question is how steep, if you're here at a certain point, you want to know how well can you measure, for example, temperature mm -hmm. if you make a very small change along magnetic field. And so you're interested in, in uh, so you, you wiggle along this line on one temperature, then you change the temperature a little bit in one direction or in the other. And that means you look at the curvature of your change along, for example, the horizontal magnetic field axis. So it's really the question if you look at the sensitivity along the magnetic field axis or along the other axis. Yeah, but you said that the sensitivity of my thermometer measure in Gauss. I think the two graphs were swapped on your slides. Um, no, if you just go ahead here, here if you go ahead, uh, to, uh, stop there. Yeah. So that, that one should be in millikelvin, right? Now it's in milligauss here according to your explanation, and then the next one is the one in, in, in vice versa, right, or not? Let me see if I have... Uh, this is sensitivity of the moment, is it not? It it's the same, huh? no? let me see. I hope I have it here. So you see, I prepared... We can, we can go a little while. A hundred... <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, da, 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 da. 
So maybe I don't have it here, but we looked into this in more detail. So it's really the question in which direction in parameter space, in which direction parameter space you go. So you have a sensitivity with respect to temperature changes or with respect to magnetic field changes. And uh, it might be, I, I think we, I did not swap, it's really here the change of temperature if you, so you have a given temperature and you want to know how much is it dependent now on your magnetic field change. And the other I can show you also, but I think it is not swapped. It is really what we have here. But anyway, I'll, I promise I'll show you. Okay. Uh, it, but it's in another talk. Good. So a very short, I wanted to show you that we can also do this using coherence, because I know you're interested in this. So what we did is we take the cesium atom now and go to the clock states, um, the magnetic field insensitive ones, and prepare a coherent superposition between those two. And then clearly, um, if you're in a mean field picture, then you get a phase shift that originates from the, the interaction with a, with, in, uh, with a rubidium gas. And this we want to see, and we do this by measuring Ramsey spectroscopy, so two pi over two pulses with an evolution time in between, and then look at the angle um, that this uh, Bloch vector precessed. Um, and of course, you all know that any inhomogeneity of density scattering lengths will lead to a dephasing, therefore, of a decay of coherence. All right, first, let's see how well we control it. A single atom in the trap without any rubidium. That's a typical Ramsey fringe. And then we see the fringe frequency as a function of laser power. That's the AC Stark shift, perfectly reproduced as a function of magnetic field. So that's the quadratic Zeeman shift. This is all very well understood, and we take this into account. If we now bring this into the rubidium gas, then what we observe are two things. There, here are two Ramsey fringes where we have here the number of cesium atoms in one spin state as a function of the phase of the last pi over two pulse. And you see there is the blue one without rubidium cloud and the green one with rubidium cloud. And you see there is first a phase shift of the fringe. That means there is an additional precession of the Bloch vector. And there is a reduction in amplitude, so there is an additional dephasing or decoherence. And both give us a piece of information, and the question is how can we understand it? And to understand it, we have to again look at the, at the molecular potential, at the interaction strength. And the, at the magnetic field where we are, there is again a Feshbach resonance between the rubidium cloud and one of the cesium states. And usually, if we talk about Feshbach resonances, you know Feshbach resonance only as a function of magnetic field. You have the typical resonance line. However, in our case, the Zeeman shift and the thermal energy are approximately the same. And that means we can tune the Feshbach resonance not only by the magnetic field, but also by the collision energy. And this, these are lines calculated by Eva Thiemann for particles having a well-defined collision energy. And you see that the resonance position shifts with collision energy in a very well-defined manner. So what we do in the following is, we go to one magnetic field, we fix it and ask the question, how is the uh, scattering length distributed over collision energies? And that's the answer. So this is the scattering length as a function of collision energy. Um, and uh, what you see is that for very low collision energies, you have extremely high scattering lengths. And for higher collision energies, you leave the Feshbach resonance for this one magnetic field, and there is no, you have left the resonance. Yes, please. Of collision energy. Yeah, you, you, um, so. It, it's the cross section explained. I mean, in the end, the, the scattering length is is the absolute uh, approximation. If you if you have no energy dependence anymore and you neglect this one over k dependence. Yeah, so it's, it's the square root of the cross section. Exactly. Yes. Yes. All right. So and now you can ask the question: How is for several temperatures the scattering length or these cross sections here distributed? And the answer is here. For a very small temperature, you have a strong contribution of the low collision energies. And that means you have a large weight here of this strong decaying um, cross-section part. For higher energies, 
you include more collision energies, but all these collision energies contribute the same scattering length or cross-section that is shown here and essentially does not change the mean value very much. From this distribution, we get now two pieces of information. The first is what is the mean scattering length or cross-section? And the second is what is the distribution of scattering length or cross-sections? The mean one, that is the one that is responsible for the precession of the block vector. Right, what's shown here is the mean scattering length or cross-section as a function of temperature. And it tells you for lower temperatures, the block vector will precess faster. And for, lower, for higher temperatures, it will precess lower. If we look now at the dispersion, at the variance of this distribution, we find that, and that is counterintuitive, for small temperatures, we have a larger variance of this distribution, and that means more dephasing. And that is just due to the proximity to the Feshbach resonance. And at high temperature, we have a much lower dephasing. Ah, oh, that's, that's strong, complicated. For the moment, you can just keep in mind, as a function of temperature, the, the angular velocity with that the block vector precesses changes. And at the same time, the speed with that the block vector dephases or disperses also changes. So now what we can do, we can do an experiment. And what you see here is um, Ramsey fringes. For every cut here, you see um, the phase of the last pi over 2 pulse. And in color coded, the number of atoms. So you see here uh, a typical sinusoidal Ramsey fringe as a function of interaction time. And what you see here, the slope, that is the changing phase that is due to the interaction with the mean field of the gas. Right? That just changes the, um, the phase. At the same time, what is not shown here very well is the decay of the amplitude, and that is here shown again in the visibility. It's just Gaussian decay of the amplitude of the visibility. And now the question is, can we, from these two numbers, the phase shift and the decay, can we infer temperature or density information? And the first thing is, if we look here, what we expect is that for low temperatures, the dephasing will dominate, and we will not be able to follow the phase shift. For high temperatures, dephasing is very low, and we will be able to also follow the, this phase shift change. So the first experiment is we look at a density variation. And behind, so what is shown here is at one density, we take a full time evolution of the phase. And each point here is a difference between the Ramsey fringes with and without atomic cloud. So the density induced change of the phase is this slope. And this slope is shown here for the correct density. And if we increase the density, we expect that the slope or the, the detuning, the dephasing should follow this. We see a strong deviation here. But it's not surprising. Because if you look at the T2 time, the dephasing time, it decays, it goes extremely fast down. It's just a few milliseconds here. And if you look at the dephasing we measure here, in principle, there is not enough time left, dephasing time, to resolve this phase shift. So that means um, that it's consistent with our observation. And the most important information comes here from the dephasing as a function of the, uh, of the density. We can. However, also do this as a function of temperature. And there, again, it does not really, it's not useful to look at the phase shift because the phase shift essentially is gone. We don't see it. We cannot resolve it. It's, it dephases too quickly. What we instead do is we look at the visibility change and from this deduce the T2 time. Again, behind every point here for a certain temperature, there is a full visibility curve. And behind every point here of the visibility curve, there is the difference of amplitude of two Ramsey fringes with and without rubidium cloud. So this is the rubidium cloud induced dephasing that changes here indeed as we expect in a certain manner with temperature. For small temperatures, we have a strong dephasing. For higher temperatures, we have a smaller dephasing. And this counterintuitive behavior, again, is just a consequence of the proximity to the Feshbach resonance. And people didn't believe that we were doing our math right. And uh, with people, I mean some referees of papers. So they made us do some Monte Carlo simulations, which we did. And it agrees very well also with our expectation here. So this model is, uh, is a very simple one, just looking at every collision, taking some effective phase shift into account. 
but it works and is somewhere hidden in some supplemental material. Okay, so much on the, on the um, probe. And now I see that the time is almost up. I have something on the engine. I would like to hear about. Um, but I don't want to. Us a little bit more time, or how are we doing? Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking, but the people are, are rebelling a lot. <laughs> I think it would be nice if you told us a little bit more about. That. I speak a bit faster. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me start with what is an engine, and what you all know is is a typical auto engine. You have a fluid in your motor, and what you do is you heat it up by igniting it. It changes temperature by keeping the volume constant. Then it expands. That does the work. And then you get rid of the fume of the exhaust, which reduces the temperature. You bring the vessel or the, the cylinder to the same, the piston to its original position, and you close the cycle. Um, and the figures of merit are the efficiency, so how much work can you output per energy that you put in, and what's the power, so the energy per cycle time. And I made this here um, intentionally very suggestive to use here harmonic oscillators because people early on asked the question, how can we go into the quantum regime? And if you have the harmonic oscillators, well, you just quantize them. So then it's very simple that you also have here a thermal distribution of populations and you do exactly the same and people have done here theory on this and this is pretty well developed. And people have done first experiments, there is um, a very a uh, famous experiment of single ions by Ferdinand schmidt kala and Kilian Singer. There was still an, a, a, a classical engine, so there is no quantum levels involved. But there were others here on spins in NMR systems, or also uh, uh, Pecola here on, on solid state systems is working a lot of it. So that is all a lot of interest in these kind of engines. And one important thing maybe is how do you define heat and work in the system? And uh, I follow the standard uh, way to do it, that heat is, in this picture of the harmonic oscillator, you keep the energy splittings constant, but you change the populations, right? That is shown here. The energy splitting or the harmonic oscillator frequency is the same, you just change the populations among them. That is heat. And work is, you keep the populations, but you change the energy splitting by changing the frequency, okay? That is how this is defined. I follow this. And now you look at this and you think, ah, equidistant levels that you can tune. That looks like a spin system that you could do. And we were thinking maybe you could, we can do this in our system. Ah, so here's a spin system, equally distributed, the same cycle. Why don't we do it? And then we did theory. And if we have the temperatures we can afford, like 200 nanokelvin and 1,000 nanokelvin, I hardly see any difference. And in the end, what you see is that in the first row, you might see there is a teeny weeny 1% population change here. And that would be the one that does the job. Uh, and I thought, I talked to Eric and, and I said, let's forget it. I'm not going into this business. And it's even worse. It's even worse if you think about thermal states, you all know from quantum optics, that the fluctuations of thermal states are larger than the mean. That's fine in an engine where you have 10 to the 23 atoms and you form a, a decent average. But if you have a single particle and you run an engine with large fluctuations, then in one cycle you have a high power. In the next cycle, because of these fluctuations, it's very small and you have one that is uh, stubborn on the, on the highway. That's not a good engine. And there was a lot of theoretical debate. Can quantum machines be efficient at all? If they're efficient, can they output large power? If they combine high efficiency and large output power, can there be small fluctuations? And there were two papers that solved this a little bit as saying there is a trade-off between power efficiency and constancy, or you have to somehow use the cycling to tame these fluctuations. And that's all for thermal states. Now the cool thing is we don't have to stick to thermal states. What we can do is in the spin system, we have a bound system and we can do population inversion. So what we did instead is the following. We use, instead of heating, we use spin exchange. And instead of thermal energy, we use spin polarization. We bring the engine, which is the single atom, into a bath that is fully spin polarized. And the spin polarization is here the energy that is stored, the fuel. The spin exchange now is directed. And that is, 
in this uh, bath state, there is only one direction of spin exchange that gives energy to the engine until you're completely polarized. Now you are in a state that can do a lot of work and the work is done in a, here we change the magnetic field. It could be a magnetic field gradient where you do work in. And then to cool the system, we bring it into a gas of opposite spin polarization. And now every spin exchange takes out energy from the engine. And that is like removing the exhaust from the engine. And then again, we change the magnetic field to close the cycle. And that is the same cycle now in a slightly different way. Instead of heat in a thermal bath, we have spin polarization and the Zeeman energy transferred to the system. So the nice thing here is, again, the spin polarization is the fuel. The heat transfer between engine and bath is directed. And the work is performed by adiabatic changes of the magnetic field. And this is an autotype cycle that you can run. And during heating and cooling, you have full counting statistics. And in addition to the mean energy that you put to the engine or take from it, you also have information about all the fluctuations that we can now study. So now the question is, like, what's the figures of merit? What's the efficiency? What's the power? And this we can calculate. And for the efficiency, there is a fair and an unfair comparison. The unfair comparison would be, you say, ah, what's the engine that, what's the energy that goes into the engine? And what's the work that is output? Then we are perfect then we are at a formula that replaces the Carnot efficiency. Instead of the, thermal, of the temperatures of the thermal bath, we just have the two magnetic fields we're in, and, and there we have an extremely high efficiency. But that's not fair, because I told you that the Landé factors between rubidium and cesium are not matched. Half of the energy is wasted by elastic collisions. And if you include this, you have here the ratio of the Landé factors entering and the efficiency drops to still surprising almost 50%. And that tells you in the end what, what we conclude from this is that this engine is something which is called endoreversible. The internal, the engine internally runs completely reversible. It's a unitary operation, of course. How could it not be? It's a single atom, nothing surprising. And the only losses occur by the contact to the bath and there is a heat leak that wastes part of the energy. About the power, the power can be also extracted by standard means looking at all taking from data, the energy we put in, take out, and the cycle time. And here as a function of time, you see it peaks. And up here, this is the number of collisions that we have in both ways. So the highest, intuitively, the highest power is if you take six uh, collisions upwards, six collisions downwards, that is the 12. Unfortunately, the last collision has, an, has a lousy scattering cross-section, and therefore the 1 over t decay of the power is already decreasing this, and therefore the maximum is a little bit before the 12th collision. And that means it tells us the highest power is if we go completely to saturation, to population inversion, and then if we have this, all what comes is a 1 over t law if, if this is constant and just the cycle time is increased. Okay. And the last is the fluctuations, where we just look at the fluctuation of the uh, population distribution, normalized to the population distribution. And what we find is we go to a regime in the end at, popu at um, population inversion, where we have subposonian fluctuations. And if we plot it all together, we see we come indeed to a position where we have maximum power output, high efficiency, and low fluctuations because we're in this regime of population inversion. All right, let me skip this. Very cool project. At some point you'll read about this. It goes into a uh, universality of the dynamics that you see afterwards. And uh, let me point out the people that I'll show you in a second are uh, because I have more projects. There is an ultra cold Fermi gas, BCBCS crossover, where we look in combination with disorder potentials and also recently built a many body engine. We have a quantum computer demonstrator together with uh, my colleague Havik Ott, Thomas Niederprüm, Klaus Sengstock from Hamburg, and uh, Henning Moritz and Peter Schmelcher. Um, that's a fun project. And I have a solid state project of NV centuries and nano diamonds, where we uh, bring them all to the tip of an optical fiber. Here you see two silver wires, uh, a very nicely structured antenna, and the glowing uh, or, um, green point here is an optical fiber for the excitation of this nano diamond. Because of these many projects, I have many people with lots of work and much dedication. And I thank you for your patience and your attention. Thanks.